Good morning, Central Texas. Phyllis Jones, your host uh, for KISS Community Connections, 103.1 KISS FM. You know what? I'm really disappointed because it didn't turn cold yet. November came. I saw no 40 degrees. I know I'm, I'm not liking this right now. Uh, I want some 40 degrees, just a little 40 degrees. And then in December, I want real snow, not the fake Texas snow. I want some snow so I can throw snowballs at people I don't know. Maybe my boss will come outside one day and I can throw snowballs at that person. She's not listening right now, so she won't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Tuesday is election day. For those who did not vote early, Tuesday is your election day. The polls are open from 7 to 7. So please remember to vote. Also, the locations of, of voting um, are on our KISS website. And also, whatever county you go, you live in, you can go to your county's website and your locations for voting are on there. Yes, it's going to be some long lines. But one thing I want you to know, if they run out of ballots, do not leave the polls. You know, a couple of years ago, and even this year for early voting, they ran out of ballots. And they were telling people to come back in an hour. Don't do that. They were telling you to uh, vote on a paper ballot. So let's talk about that paper ballot. If you do have to vote on a paper ballot because they ran out of ballots, your paper ballot, you open it, they open up the emergency slot and you drop your ballot into the emergency slot. The problem with your paper ballot is that machine didn't count it and that machine can't count it because it's made out of the wrong paper. So it drops into an emergency slot. That night when the judges take those ballots in, your paper ballot is simply handed to somebody to count. Whether the other ballots have already been tabulated on the machine, your paper ballot that was made from a copy due to them running out of ballots is handed to a group of people to count by hand. So, you know, to me, that's leaving my ballot in the hands of the unknown because I don't know what they're going to do with my ballot. You know, they could throw it away. They cannot count it because there's no proof as it goes by. So, if, you, if but if you stay... And they tell you that we have paper ballots. You don't have to vote on it. You can tell them you're going to wait for the delivery of some regular ballots. So be mindful of your of your duties and your rights. Also, ID. Yes, Texas did lose the voter ID fight. But our attorney general, the illustrious one, who's determined to win this fight, we still do have to take an ID in there with us. So along with your voter registration card, you do need another piece of ID to take with you. If you do not have that other ID, you'll be, you can vote on a provisional ballot. And also, our lovely Attorney General, you can vote on, a, you'll be signing a piece of paper and it's called an oath of declaration. And the oath of declaration is saying that you really are a registered voter, you just don't have your ID. Why do we have to do that this year? Because he said he would charge anybody who signs the declaration and later turns out not to be a valid voter. Also, he's doing that because he's going to bring the law up again for us to lose. And this way, he'll have proof because if you vote and you're not a registered voter, that's voter fraud, and thus he will have a case. He lost the case last time because there was no, no fraud. How do I know? Uh, most of you know I'm the state education chair for the NAACP, and statewide, we fought. We fought hard, and we won. Uh, so we want to win again. Also, for those of you who say, my vote don't count, let's think about that. Let's, let's forget about the famous, oh, our, our forefathers fought and died for that. If our vote does not count, then why is Texas, North and South Carolina, Florida fighting so bad to keep you from voting? If your vote didn't count, they wouldn't be fighting the way they are to keep you from voting. There's no way. They just simply wouldn't care. But obviously, your vote does count because they're, they're fighting to shut us down to make sure it's harder. You know, with the voter ID bill when Texas had it before, a lot of people didn't have all this. You had senior citizens had to go get a, vote, a ID card just so they can vote, which meant to me it was a poll tax because it, it cost you twenty five dollars to get the card to go vote. So um, we don't we want to get away from all that. So those of you who said my vote doesn't count, think about it again. They're trying to take it away from you. So I'm not gonna give you the forefather speech because we all hear that, but I'm gonna give you the today one. They're trying to take your vote away, your rights to vote away, and make it harder for you to vote. So. Everything you do, go vote. Also, if you have a problem with voting, if you live in Bell County, you will call Sean Snyder. Um, and it's, once again, you can go to the Bell County website and get his phone number. But also, a number you can call is 866-687-8683. 
it's a bunch of eights i know but you can dial 866-687-8683 and you'll be talking to a team of lawyers at that time and their job they'll be there the whole time they're there the whole day in fact they're they're past seven they're there will be starting at 7 a.m and they will stay on the lines to talk to people for t t 12 midnight because as we know sometimes the polls will close will be open longer also seven o'clock is the shutoff time if you are the last person in line and it's till eight o'clock you still get to vote because the last person in line we send somebody someone to be behind that person to make sure that they do vote so no matter how long the line is if someone's behind you and they work for the polling site you will still get to vote even though it could be an hour later so i'm gonna say it again you need to vote if you say there's no one to run for, then you vote for the lesser of evils and, and vote for someone. Because if you don't vote, you vote for the one who do, you didn't want to win. Remember that. You don't vote, the person you didn't want to win, when they win, you got to be quiet. You can't say nothing because you didn't vote. Okay, so I'm off my voting soapbox. Y'all know you're going to get it. <laughs> you know what's coming. So today I have a, 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 a guest that's different. You know, I, I try to talk about all categories. Uh, you know, and generally this one category, I never have anybody on my show, but um, from KISD, we have Mr. Joseph Welsh, and he's the Director of Student Services. Executive Director it's, for Student Services. And he's coming on the show to explain what Student Services is, because, you know, a lot of parents in KISD, um, when you yell and you complain and you want to do something about whatever's happening, you go to the wrong people you go to the wrong person and then you don't get the right answer because you went to the wrong person because let's face it if you come to somebody you might get the wrong answer but they might not direct you to who you need to see sometimes just sometimes and i'm, I'm you know he's, he's like no she didn't say that but yeah I did. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. can you explain what student services does yes ma'am uh good morning and thank you for having me uh today uh, student services, uh, we're just that, literally. We're, we're there to help students and, and their families get through or traverse the educational system. Um, myself, as the executive director of student services, I oversee a large number of departments. Um, I oversee transportation, student nutrition, uh, student code of conduct, district hearing, uh, student health, uh, uh, attendance officers, uh, fi um, fine arts programs, our fine arts programs. Um, there's probably a, several others that I'm forgetting right now because when I'm put on the spot, I tend to forget them. But uh, needless to say, um, if it affects the student outside of the classroom, odds are I probably oversee that department. So uh, what we try to do in student services is when a parent has a problem, you know, there is a, a, a system in place and you can find that system typically in our student code of conduct. You know, for example, if it's a disciplinary issue, you know, it goes from the may go from the teacher to the AP to the principal and then it will come to me to make final decision on, on it if it's a, a discipline infraction. So if you're the, lack of better words, the perpetrator and you've received the referral, it comes to me. If it's a you know, parent is, uh, doesn't like necessarily the way that they've been treated by the administrator when they went to talk about it, that goes to uh, one of our executive directors for instructional leadership. So, so. What, what isn't your department? What, what don't you, you know what I mean? Because, okay, we're going to go into what you do, really, really, we're okay. into, into all of that. But what part of students don't you cover? Well, you know, uh, when it comes to the curriculum side of the house, that, right. that's, that's not under my umbrella. Okay. Um, but that's not to say that we don't still try and assist. When a call comes into my office, I have two wonderful uh, ladies that work directly for me, uh, um, Ms. Jenny Espinosa and Ms. Phyllis Wright. And we, we, we believe in not passing you along. What we do and what they do is they, they listen to your problem. They make a determination. Can we answer it? If we don't have the answer because it's not under our umbrella, they will direct you exactly to the individual you need rather than say, well, that sounds like this or sounds like that um, because we're not in the business of just, you know, patching you around because we don't want to help. We try and resolve the problem. And a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll intervene for you and, and go directly to that individual to try and help assist still. Okay. So we're gonna go to my favorite one okay because it's the one i don't like our nutrition student nutrition that, that falls that, up that, under you that's directly what, under what, me. what 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 part of that do you I, up under I, you? I oversee the entire department i have a director who runs the day-to-day -day operations but that director answers to me so who decides the meals where did that come from <laughs> you know that's an excellent question <laughs> and i'm and i'm actually i'm actually glad you asked that question um the meal the, the decisions on the meal believe it or not 
we actually take to the students. Before the year starts, typically the year before, we actually have taste tests where we invite um, uh, many students from elementary, middle school, and high school, and we take it to campuses. We even, for example, last year we had it at Harker Heights High School. Right. Year before that, I'm mean, actually we had two: one at Harker Heights, one at uh, uh, Eastern Hills Middle School. Mm -hmm. And we actually went sent buses to other schools to get kids, so that it wasn't just this one campus's right. opinion. We went and bust kids over, and we said, "Okay, here's here's all of the things that our vendors." are offering us and, and of course you know they have to meet the healthy food snack that but here are the here are the things that they're offering us and we had it prepared by our professional chef and we put it out there for the kids you know i mean it was it was like a professional taste test right you know you add a little water to wash your mouth out in between meals so that it's, it's a fresh mm -hmm. taste um and they taste and they decide what it is we like and then from there those are the things that we plan and we put on our menus for the upcoming season uh, does is it does anyone look at or pay attention to like okay let's say on a tuesday yes on a tuesday's menu mm -hmm. um does anybody ever pay attention to how much of tuesday's food is thrown out you you know what i mean <laughs> yes yeah does it does that ever does that ever go into always we 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 do we have we have a cafeteria manager at, e at each campus so you know uh, some places you have a centralized location that makes all the food and ships it out. That's right. not what we do in KISD. Okay. We actually prepare every meal on site. Mm -hmm. And so at our cafeteria managers, they do monitor, you know, what, what we seem to be having excess of, what mm -hmm. the children like, don't like, and they report that back in. And so just because we initiate a plan of action with right. the meal, we do change, adjust those depending upon the likes and dislikes of our students. And, you know, that, that example you gave was mm -hmm. a great one. You know, on a Tuesday, if we're serving spaghetti every Tuesday, but right. no kids seem to want spaghetti, right. then we allow that campus to change from spaghetti to something that the kids desire. Okay, now what about the kids who have food allergies mm -hmm. and also the kids who, through religion beliefs, yes. don't eat certain things? Yes. How does that come into play with that child at those campuses? Well, we, we, we typically have multiple entrees actually every day. So you, you rarely will come into a, a deal where you have one single entree. We, okay. we have multiple. And for those kids, we have the health history record, which mm -hmm. we get so we know what allergies. And we have a, a point of sale system that actually for each kid, when they put in their number, right. it pops up and it tells you what allergies they have. So our cashier makes sure that that child isn't eating something there or have something on their plate they shouldn't. Um, and then when we're notified by the parent about a, a religious belief or whatever belief it is that they can't have this, that, or the other, right. it also is identified in that POS system also to tell the cashier so that if the child mistakenly grabs something not mm -hmm. knowing, they identify it and they'll, you know, very politely let the, let the child know, you know, maybe your mom or dad doesn't want you to have mm -hmm. that, so let's find you something else that you could have. Okay, because mm -hmm. a lot of we here, well, mm -hmm. I work at a school district, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think we work... I, I said not campus, but I think we work with the toughest group of kids, which mm -hmm. is elementary, because, you mm -hmm. know, today they like hamburgers, tomorrow, yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, because uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. they, they change every day, right. they change every minute, and it's always, you know, you look at certain kids and they go, well, I can't do this through, through my beliefs, right. and you look at what's served, you go, well, hmm, okay, uh, we have a problem there, because... Well, typically, yeah. if that situation occurs, what I would ask them to do is call um, our student nutrition main office mm -hmm. and, and notify them uh, what's going on. Because typically what's happening in that situation is we haven't been made aware that, okay. that this child needs something different. different because right. um, I can tell you a personal situation where I've worked with directly with our uh, campus um, because I am a former building principal as well at Maine Middle School as, as in addition to uh, some other schools here. Um, where when the parent comes in and notifies us, we notify student nutrition and the student nutrition make sure when they take a look at their menu, right. that when at all possible, frankly, they'll avoid serving that type of thing altogether. But if it's something that's a very popular item, uh -huh. they will always right. make sure when that item comes that they've they've um, created an additional meal specifically for said student. I mean, right. I, I can tell you when I was in, at, again, at Maynard Middle School, uh -huh. we had uh, some students who had a very, um, stringent if you will right. dietary requirements and no matter what we had our cafeteria manager always had these in, and it was out of 700 kids it was three kids right but every day yeah they had their separate three items right. and it was it, you know it wasn't a problem but again that that goes back to the communication you know we we you know they have to be notified 
and who sets the prices for um, your your staff versus the right. kids? Right. The prices the prices for uh, meals are actually um, based upon what the state requires us. Okay. To to um, uh, uh, charge, we we try to stay within right what they want because we don't want to you know the reality is they they give you a, a price and you can go beyond that price but you can't charge any less than that price okay and what we try to do is we take it to the board typically every other year mm -hmm. and we try to set our price so that it's it's right it's right where that is but we may uh, to be honest with you we may go a dime more right. than what they require yeah simply because not that we're trying to generate a profit but we know that next year they're going to come back and tell us to raise the nickel. Right. And so rather than every year your price yeah. goes up, we say we can go up this. And that way, you know, your price stays steady for at least two to three years. Okay. All right. So let's, you said you have transportation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's go to your transportation. Okay. <laughs> is there a limit on how long kids can be on the bus or is there not? Um, because you by law, By law, no, there's not. Okay. Um, there's not, but one of the big things that we, we try and do in KISD is we, we work really hard to keep a child on the bus no longer than about 45 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, sometimes that may occur because traffic conditions. Um, one of the things, you know, this is not clean of 1980 and, uh, you know, a lot more people and, and, mm -hmm. you know, things happen out there on the road. And also our borders are expanding. You know, they're expanding. Um, you know, and I'm glad you talked about transportation because if you will allow me, I would love sure. to give a shot here. Um, we are we are calling, making an emergency call to any and everyone with CDL license that would be interested in driving a school bus, helping give back to our children of the future and doing a wonderful service while while also making a, a decent paycheck. Um, if you have any desire, please contact our HR department. We are, um, shall I say, short, and that would be an understatement, uh, drivers. Uh, last time I spoke with our, our director of transportation, we were sitting about We've gotten a few more in, but we're still sitting about 40 some odd drivers short. And, you know, speaking to uh, time a child is, has on the bus, mm -hmm. that that is another direct effect, uh, you know, on how long a child has to stay on the bus. Because with longer, with a larger map right. and, and not enough drivers, sometimes we have to extend ride times. But we really try our, our darndest to keep those those ride times to about 45 minutes or so. Okay, so as far as pay. Yes, ma'am. And our drivers, are our bus drivers making a comparison rating with the, the hop and all the other bus places, or are we lower, or can we even get into the fight? Well, Where I, are I, we? I think <laughs> I, I, I like I like, love to answer that by by saying this. You know, when you when you're dealing with public education, you're never yeah. really going to compete with a private business right. because a private business, if they want to pay more, they're just going to mm -hmm. increase the, the the bottom line to the consumer, but. You know, actually, we are comparable to, to hop. Right. Um, you know, and, and per hour pay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I'm not going to sit here and, and say that, you know, we're right. we're outperforming or outpaying, right, right. you know, a lot of private businesses where you can get, you know, 60, 80 hours a week if you want to. Um, no, we're, 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 we're diligently trying and, and our uh, superintendent and our um, chief, finance, our chief um, human resource officer working very, very hard to find ways to... Um, look at that pay structure. I can tell you we were in a meeting uh, about a month or so ago where we were talking about that that very fact, mm -hmm. trying to find a way to adjust our pay structure and, and really become a lot more um, competitive even with private businesses. You know, but but right. but this shortage of bus drivers, I'll be honest with yeah. you, Phyllis, it's it's a statewide problem. Yeah. I mean, I was in San Antonio at a conference a couple of weeks right. ago driving up the 35 and I see this huge sign and, yeah. and I was in downtown San Antonio yeah. You know, yeah, a yeah. huge sign. Drivers need it. Um, you know, driving is a skill. It's a skill set now. Um, you know, this is no longer having CDLs. You have to be a cross country driver to make a decent living. Right. And you can leave your house at six in the morning and be home at six in the evening, and make a decent living now. So, you know, it, it's it, it's tough. And we understand that, but but we are making that call to all those. You know, whether you want to do it part time or full time, we're looking for help. So has just. KISD's transportation, or either whoever goes out, you have a lot of soldiers who just get out. Yes, they, they just get out there. You yes, know what I mean? They're yes, not, do they know? Or does Fort Hood put that into their, you know, packet or when they get to leave as an option for some of these soldiers who are getting out and have no clue what they're going to do right. when they get out? <clears throat> you know, we, we, we actually uh, met with Fort Hood also about a month, month and a half ago to work with them. And we've, we've developed some partnerships. As a matter of fact, uh, 
I think it was just last week we had a a mini a career fair with Fort Hood and veterans right. and right. veteran spouses as well. Something that we we came together to alert them to. Um, one of the things though, also with Fort Hood that I learned in our meeting is uh, when they when they pr talk about jobs and the transition, there are some specific requirements that they have that sometimes may make it difficult and you know to to for them to actively say you can right. go get this job because depending upon you know your your pay your rank and different mm -hmm. things they can't necessarily say you know if you're making thirty dollars an hour yeah. at a type of job that they can recommend one that you're going to make half that amount for but we have formed a partnership and i think Good. it's 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 really flourishing we've we've even uh formed a partnership with ctc and their mm -hmm. uh, driver training programs Good. Um, I mean, we, we, we're exploring all and any opportunities and always looking for a new ones. So if there's anyone listening to this show and, and have a new uh, opportunity for us to take a look at, please contact me directly at 254-336-2822 uh, or our HR department. I have one for you, too. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have, okay, you know, we're a very culturally diverse community. Yes. We have a Liberian Association in Killeen. <laughs> okay. So I I'll that. give you their information please. to contact and because we have different I, i'm learning now mm -hmm. i've been to most of these but we have a mm -hmm. lot of associations yes, that we think all connect but some of them don't yes so i i met them in fact they have a, um, a liberian veterans association okay and next weekend they're having a soccer tournament here oh that's <laughs> awesome that's absolutely awesome yeah uh, and and also they want to um introduce soccer mm -hmm. to the city of Killeen, and but that or those associations right. i'll give you their contact Please. information yeah because you know one of the yeah. things we also do phyllis is we actually will train you to get your cdl right so if you have a desire you may yeah. not actually have them in hand but we'll train you and pay you while we're training you okay to get them but you know you talk about soccer um <laughs> one of the departments I, I was over but we did a reorganization a couple years ago was athletics uh -huh. and and when i was over it we actually introduced middle school soccer right at the end of the at the end of the year because it is such a growing mm -hmm. uh it was well, the number one sport in the world mm -hmm. But um, here locally with our diverse community, it, it is a very popular sport. And so we thought that it was time that we introduced it. Now, so we have some soccer players mm -hmm. who actually play with their, they're not pro, but whatever you call it before you uh, get to the pros. Like semi or, or yes, development they, league. Yeah, they, have, they live here. Yeah. They, they live right here. Right. I mean, this is, yeah, it's, they're, it's, they're it's right amazing. Here, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing that yeah. the, 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 I shouldn't say amazing, but it, it's, it's outstanding the amount of talent, you know, mm -hmm. not only athletically but but intellectually that we have here. I mean, right. in, in our in this area, it was, it's a gold mine. Yeah. And, and I tell people, you know, I came from Southern California, San Diego, to be precise. And many people, when they hear that, they say, "Why would you come to Colleen?" And I would tell them because Colleen is what America was is what America is supposed to be. And I'm glad that I have an opportunity to be here and be a part of it as it as it grows and expands. I, I, I tell them, you know, when you travel around the world, and I'm a military brat, mm -hmm. and you know, 22 and a half years. My dad served uh, for the Navy. When I when I arrived here, and it was you know it was his plan, you know if you will, and I don't want to get religious on you, but it was God's plan for me to come here because I had never thought about coming here. And and the first time I did, within six months, I moved my entire family back here. You know this is this is an outstanding place and the place I hope to spend my entire life. I mean, from the diversity, yeah. um, you know, culturally, ethnically, you know, even social economically. I mean. This is what America is supposed to be because when you're here, we have a great educational system. Things yeah. we offer things that that I came from a district of 250,000 students. We didn't even offer, right. but we offer it here. And and the opportunities for our, our children and, and the growth. You know, I'm, I, I joke to, with people about being a, a, a former old economics and, and and history teacher, but I always tell them I say, you know, one of the first things I realized when I came here was this place is ripe for economic growth. I mean, you have plane trains and automobiles is the way I like to phrase it. Meaning when you're in manufacturing and you're going to you're going to put down your company, what you're looking for is planes, trains and automobiles. Meaning you're looking for, right. you know, can you can you transport via truck? Well, you know, 190 is now was it I I 14 or I 16? I 14. Yes. I 14. Mm -hmm. We have an airport that when you look up in the sky, you think you see a spaceship landing because the planes are so large that they can land. Mm -hmm. And one day, hopefully it will become an international. And for those that don't know, that simply means you drop a second a second runway. Right. But our runway that we have currently is larger than most, uh, probably larger than the one, the DFW. Yeah. You know, and, and then, you know, the trains. I mean, we have a train that runs right through the middle of downtown. And when you come up, as I was coming up here, 
you know, I yeah. looked over and you saw this yeah. real head with yeah. like 20 <laughs> different tracks. Yeah. You know, so you have all of the things. And then, you know, even uh, economically, you know, when I was in San Diego, you know, you offer somebody $20 an hour and they look down their nose at it. You know, twenty dollars an hour here, you can live real good. Yeah, you can. You, you know, can. so yeah. I mean, this is this is a great place, and and you know, my my younger two kids that have grown up here now, mm -hmm. uh, we've been here for ten years, and I started actually right here in Coppers Cove as a teacher coach, and went to a, a, a ch two championships, one in football and one in track, and then became an assistant principal at Cove Junior, and give a shout out to Randy Tribe, who was my mentor uh, while I was there before going on to Ellison with David Dominguez. And then taking over Maynard Middle School, which was an awesome experience. And once a Ram, always a Ram. And then, then into my current position, which is Executive Director of Student Services. And that was here. I mean, you know, uh, and I don't want to take up all of the time. No, but, no, you're good. You got plenty of time. But, you know, before I came here, you know, I started my career. Uh, and, and I shouldn't say you know, but many people don't realize I started my career uh, not wanting to be in K-12 <laughs> education. I started my career as a college coach. And I coached college football for many years till a mentor of mine asked me to come back and help with my old alma mater because we had such a, a bad attendance problem, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I went back and I, I became the assistant attendance coordinator and helped turn it from having a 35% daily absentee rate to down, down to less than nine, um, which directly affected graduation rates. You know, I was later promoted to a voluntary ethnic enrollment program coordinator for the district. Uh, again, San Diego uh, Unified School District, 250,000 student district before I decided to go on and get back into coaching at Portland State University. Um, so, you know, it's been a very diverse opportunity for me and, and you know, did that for a little bit. And one day came home to my, to my <laughs> wife and I, <clears throat> I said to her, baby, I want to, I want to go get my master's degree. And uh, to, my, to my wife's credit, Heather, love you. She just looked at me and said, okay. And so we packed up and left Oregon, went back to San Diego where I got a job um, as a counselor, recruiter, for our national university, then became international programs counselor, and then director for um, enrollment services. And, and so I supervised 13 campuses from San Diego to the south to Redding, California on the northern border. And uh, had a great opportunity, great career, learned a lot while I was there, finished my master's. And then one day I came home, Phyllis, again, <laughs> and I said, babe, I said, there's a different calling for me. And she just kind of gave me that look like, what is it? Yeah. And uh, I said, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to teach K-12. And she said, if that's what you want, okay. So I went back to school, got my uh, teaching credential after I had my master's degree. Because in California, it's, we call it a fifth year. It's essentially getting another master's. I did it, then became a head football coach. Well, coordinator first, then a head football coach, six day program, got them into the playoffs after they hadn't been there for several years and uh, was enjoying it. And then, you know, we were getting to the point where we were like, crime was high and, and a lot of, you know, economics and price of real estate in California was just getting ridiculous. We were looking to leave and, and that's when I was brought to Texas. You know, and I right. say it that way because it was a plan. Yeah. And I came and, and you know, we've been here now 10 years and, and have loved it, you know. And so I've been very blessed and I want to help and give back, you know, to this community yeah. because this community has done so much for me. You know, I mean, I was, as a beginning, I was sharing my career with you, but I always like to let people know also, and especially young people, that in life, I had a saying, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, it only matters where you where you mm -hmm. end up. Because my very first job in public schools, very first job, I was going to junior college. I was a part-time custodian at Fulton Elementary School and worked my way up, you know, to, to, to where I am today. And so I always tell kids, you know, if you believe in yourself and you're out there willing to, as the kids say, you're willing to grind, mm -hmm. You can accomplish anything you want and use education to help you climb that ladder.